Ladies and gentlemen, an announcing the arrival of the Chief Minister of Penang, Yang Ahmad Bahoma Lim Guan Eng. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our forum today. Before the start of the event, we would like to seek your cooperation by switching off all mobile phones and any sound emitting devices. Thank you. A very good afternoon to Yang Ahmad Bohomat Lim Guan Eng, Chief Minister of Penang, Professor Dato Wu Wing Tai, Executive Director of Penang Institute, YB Zairel Kia Johari, Chief Executive Officer of Penang Institute, YB Stephen Sim, Director of Penang Institute, and our esteemed guest lecturer, Mr. Chia Cheng Hai, Chairman and Co-CIO of Value Partners. Thank you everyone for coming to our Penang Institute public lecture series titled From Journalist to Fund Manager, Discussion of an Unusual Career Path and Stock Market Investing, Five Important Lessons. I'm Sulin and I will be your MC for today. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you once again for taking your time out on a Thursday afternoon. We would now like to invite YB Zairel Kil Johari, CEO of Penang Institute, to give his welcoming address. Thank you, Sulin. Uh, Yang Wabumat, I'm Slim Gwan Eng, Chief Minister of Penang. Uh, Professor Dr. Wu Wing Tai, our Executive Director, uh, YB Stephen Sim, uh, Member of Parliament for Bukit Tajam and also Director uh, of uh, Penang Institute. Of course, our esteemed uh, guest of honour today, Mr. Chia Cheng Hai, the Chairman of uh, Value Partners of Hong Kong. Of, um, on behalf of the Penang Institute, I'd like to wish all of you good afternoon and uh, welcome to today's public lecture uh, featuring, of course, Mr. Chia Cheng Hai. I think uh, we're in for a treat today because Mr. Chia will not only do one, but uh, actually two talks. Uh, the first will be titled From Journalist to Fund Manager, uh, while well, the second will be on Stock Market Investing, Five Important Lessons, probably why most of us are here today. <coughs> There will be a short tea break in between the two sessions, so um, just to you all know. Um, of course, we are doubly proud to host uh, Mr. Chia here because uh, he is a Penangite himself, uh, born and bred in Penang. He attended the Penang Free School, and, uh, and as the title of the first lecture reveals, uh, he actually started off as a journalist uh, working with the Star. Uh, before moving to Hong Kong and becoming a uh, correspondent for the Asian Wall Street Journal and after that the uh, unfortunately now defunct uh, Far Eastern Economic Review. Um, and after a successful career as a journalist, uh, Mr. Chia embarked on what was to become a more successful career uh, in investing. Uh, first as the head of uh, research and proprietary trading at uh, Morgan Grenfell & Company and then going on to co-found his own company, Value Partners. And what started off as a small venture involving uh, 5 million US dollars in 1993, soon grew into a fund with uh, an assets under management worth around USD 9 billion. Value Partners now ranks uh, as number one in Hong Kong and Southeast Asia. And in 2007, Value Partners became the first value investing fund management company to be listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. And today, uh, with an average of 16.6% .6 annual return for the last 20 years and a clientele of 2 million, Value Partners has been listed among Barron's best 100 hedge funds. And Mr. Chia himself has won numerous awards, uh, including CIO of the Year by Asia Asset Management, Capital Markets Person of the Year by Finance Asia, 25 Most Influential People in Asian Hedge Funds by Asian Investors, and in the Chinese media, they call him the Warren Buffet of the East. Um, and in that addition to his, fund, as, as in, to his work as a fund manager, Mr. Chia also holds public office in, uh, as a non-official member of the Hong Kong Financial Services 
uh, Development Council. And uh, on the more academic side, uh, he's also an honorary fellow uh, of the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, where he has also established the uh, Value Partners Center for Investing, which is uh, Hong Kong's first academic training uh, and research center for grooming investment, future investment professionals. I'm sure more, all of us here are very interested to learn how Mr. Chia, how and why Mr. Chia made the switch from journalism to investing, and even more importantly, how he came to cultivate such a successful portfolio over two decades, having coped uh, successfully with various um, uh, financial crises over the two decades, the Hong Kong handover, the SARS crisis, uh, the dot-com boom, the dot-com bust, the Lehman Brothers collapse, and of course, the uh, ever-changing investment and technologi technological landscape. So I'm sure we'll all enjoy ourselves today. I thank you all once again for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I wish everyone a very pleasant and hopefully fruitful lecture ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, YB Zairil, for the welcoming address. We would now like to invite Chief Minister of Penang, Yang Ahmad Bohomad Lim Guanling, on stage to give his welcoming speech. Thank you. Uh, the Executive Director of Penang Institute, Professor Dr. Dr. Wing Tai, the Chief Executive Officer Zaryl Q. Johari, Director Stephen Sim, of course, all the uh, staff uh, in Penang Institute welcoming uh, Penang's uh, pride uh, and joy, uh, Mr. Cha Ching Hai, and um, all the wonderful people who are gathered uh, on this working Thursday to listen to Asia's or Malaysia's Warren Buffett. I would like to begin by congratulating PI for organizing this public lecture uh, with the rather uh, interesting title from journalist to fund manager, discussion of an unusual career path. I'm sure we'll all be enthralled to hear directly from the horse's mouth about the success story of um, Cha Cheng Hai uh, how he rose from practically nothing to be, at one time, the largest taxpayer in Hong Kong. I think that's a problem when you don't know how to retain talented uh, Malaysians. They end up becoming the biggest taxpayer, not in Malaysia, but in other countries. I, we, are in for, we are in for a rare treat today because Mr. Chia will not be giving one, but two talks. And, uh, you know, this is really giving us value for money. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, modern economies are often built alongside strong and robust financial markets, which largely comprises of bond, equity, and forex. These financial markets play a significant role in our economy, the effects of which extends beyond the daily price fluctuations that one observes in the media. And of course, uh, it has also resulted in sometimes uh, financial crisis um, and uh, uh, various suggestions have been made to clamp some of these excesses, including, of course, the so-called Tobin tax and, of course, uh, the more extreme version by our former Prime Minister, Tun Dr. Mahathir, to arrest all these fellas, get rid of speculators. But if we all do basic uh, business finance, we know that the speculative liquidity is an essential component of to, uh, that drives capital markets. And um, it is how that we how do we control these excesses? And this is where I think uh, government oversight comes in. If you have professional, transparent, accountable, and clean government regulation, I'm sure the excess excesses can be controlled and um, some of the uh, rather uh, speculative effects can be mitigated. Indeed, the hidden impact of uh, capital markets are quite enormous. Even without going through the past uh, 
financial crisis, uh, whether it's 97 or even the earlier 2007, I think that would be expanded at great length by Shanghai. But the recent cut in outlook for Malaysia by Fitch ratings has caused the ringgit to depreciate against all major currencies. How strong our currency can be seen uh, by the fact that, you know, you compare to Singapore, you got 2.57. What's, what's the latest now? Kelvin, 2.57. Huh? 2.6. Ah? No, it's not 2. La, and lowest is 2.59. 2.56, is it? 2.56, 2.57. And uh, this has, of course, uh, resulted in uh, uh, imported inflation. And, of course, the cut in ratings may lead to a direct impact of higher cost of borrowings, uh, which would have an impact not only for Malaysia as a sovereign entity, but also for Malaysian corporations. A ratings downgrade would potentially filter down to affect the abilities of government, corporations, and even individuals to borrow for capital investments, besides resulting in high inflation for consumers through a higher cost of imports. No doubt, the root cause of the outlook revision by Fitch ratings is Malaysia's mounting federal government debt. We are now at an estimated value of 502 billion ringgit, which is 53% of GDP. Now, that doesn't include contingent liabilities. Contingent liabilities is closer to 150 billion. And if that is factored in, contingent liabilities, there's guarantees that the government have given, for example, the Pork Klang free trade zone scandal. That is a government guarantee and expected to cost around 13.5. So if all this is factored in, the uh, loan obligations will amount to an extra 150 billion ringgit. So contingent liabilities works up to 150 billion. And if that is included, that means our debt, federal government debt to GDP ratio will be 70%. And in other words, that exceeds the statutory limit of 55%. So in other words, we are doing something unlawful and illegal. Of course, there's nothing new in Malaysia. Everything is done unlawfully and illegally. So I even say this government is not really lawful because they only won 47% of the vote. No? <laughs> Whereas the party that won 51% of the vote didn't win uh, power. But if we want to observe the, both the spirit and the letter of the law, uh, there is a need to take into account contingent liabilities. And contingent liabilities have a um, very vicious way of coming to haunt you when there's a sudden sharp downturn in the world's economy. So the severity of the Malaysia's public debt issue and also was also echoed by Moody's last week, which emphasized that Malaysia's rating could come under pressure from the deterioration in its financial strength. Any ratings cut when, coincided, when coinciding with the tapering of large-scale as asset purchases by the US Federal Reserve, expected to commence in September, would have a severe negative impact on Malaysia's ability to borrow cheaply. Of course, the sudden weakness in the stock exchange is just one um, possible uh, consequences. Uh, Bloomberg reported recently that Syarikat Prasarana Negara Berhad may have to pay half, one, half of a percent more interest rate for its 1 billion ringgit debt due in 10 to 15 years. This is equivalent to 5 million ringgit more per annum in interest payments. And more interesting, when we talk about these issues of bonds, I think you are aware of the one Malaysia, one MDB bonds, isn't it? How much is that? 38 billion ringgit. Done through Goldman Sachs and uh, with a very high rate, almost 2% higher than the market rate. And you look at 38 billion, my God. 1% is a huge sum of money. That's why suddenly you find certain people, uh, especially one very bright young Penang Knight, suddenly have money to throw and to burn. 
particularly in my constancy of every day. Now, all this gives rise to concerns of proper and professional management. The fiscal deficits and high public debt level of the federal government contrasts starkly with the financial situation in Penang. Now, I have to talk about Penang because if I criticize the way the uh, federal or the way the uh, fiscal policies, fiscal and monetary policies are managed, how is it done in Penang? First, we talk about Deficit, uh, Malaysia is uh, suffering from a deficit, budget deficit continuously. They say, oh, they'll cap it at 4%. Uh, we, we won't know whether that will be possible. But there is a deficit every year. And yes, Malaysia has been suffering a deficit for the last 16 years. For the last 16 years, Malaysia has suffered a deficit. In contrast, in the six years that we have been in government, for every year in that six years, Penang has enjoyed a surplus, including a surplus of 138 million ringgit last year, which is the largest surplus ever recorded in Penang's history. And that works out to be nearly 15% of our total budget. So the surplus is 15% of our total budget. Um, and this is not something that is cooked, you know. The accounts are not cooked. This is verified by the yearly Auditor General's report. And more importantly, we have also managed to reduce Penang's debts by 95%, whilst increasing our state assets by 50%. So I think you are seeing that in that respect, uh, you can sleep easy and peacefully, Malay, uh, Penang is definitely not going bankrupt. Now, these achievements have been made possible through the introduction of a governance model based on CAT, competency, accountability, and transparency. Through CAT governance, we have managed to stem corruption and wastage, hence saving public funds and contributing to our surplus. Some of the measures instituted, competitive tenders, uh, public declaration of assets, uh, I think, and also, of course, uh, banning any uh, business dealings between uh, family members of government leaders with the government, uh, I think, are critical to ensure that there is full accountability and transparency. I'd like to emphasize here that it's important to realize that good governance must accompany sound economic policies. Only then can our potential be fully realized. However, despite strong fundamentals and exemplary record of financial management, it is unfortunate that Penang is unable to tap in to leverage this good performance by tapping in to these financial markets at prefer preferential rates because we cannot borrow without federal treasury or federal government's approval. So in that context, from Malaysia, and I think uh, taking lessons from Penang, but in a more macro context, there are three areas that require attention for improvement, especially in the Malaysian equity market. I'm sure um, Cheng Hai, which is vast experience, will be able to share with us how you can earn money honestly in a capital market that tries to be as free and fair as possible which gives every stock market punter, I mean, a fair go, a level playing field. If they lose, everybody lose. If they win, everybody wins. You cannot profit through insider information. So in that context, there are three areas that require attention. First, there's a need for a transparent and level playing field. Corruption can occur in equity markets through insider training. Insider trading, which is unjust detrimental to market integrity and our cost benefits those who are well connected. And we have seen many high profile cases. I would not intend to go through them, I'll leave it to uh, Cheng Hai. So it is important that for the Malaysian Security Commission and of course, Brusa Malaysia, that there's a need for enforcement and of course, 
no exemption to those who are well connected. You always, you always see that those who are well connected, they can get away with anything. And it's an open secret. They can get away with anything. No action is taken. But then uh, there are others, uh, not so lucky ones, who will face and maybe rightly so, face the full brunt of the law. The only question is this, why is there no equal enforcement? Why are there double standards? And I say this, that I think the Securities Commission and Busan Malaysia are una unable to um, enforce the law, and there are clear cases of double standards. Uh, I've even, you know, even for PBA, we wonder why we are punished for the mistakes made by the previous board of directors. And we have actually um, complained uh, openly and publicly, and even in our letters, we use very strong words. Of course, they did not take any further action against us for using such strong words against Busa Malaysia, that they are incompetent, they practice double standards, and you know, in some, some respects, they are an utter disgrace to Malaysia. And how can you talk, how can you uh, develop a mature developed market when you practice? double standards, and you are unprofessional and incompetent. I say that as chairman of PVA, a listed company. Listed company is very scared of Bursa Malaysia. No, this one, PVA, not scared of Bursa Malaysia. We want to challenge Bursa Malaysia because we are clean. And when you are clean, you can challenge those who are not clean. But the whole market, capital market cannot be developed in a mature manner when there's no uh, level playing field, where there's no strict enforcement of the law and the rules. Secondly, I think as I mentioned, three areas. There's the first area, there must be uh, enforcement, and there must be respect for uh, the rules of law. Secondly, there's a need to require the institutionalization of open competitive tenders, so that shareholders, especially minority shareholders, can be protected and of course, ensure maximum or optimal returns. In that respect, I think uh, if we want to institutionalize uh, uh, transparency and of course accountability, competitive tenders is essential. Uh, most private companies practice that, but there are also JLCs who do not practice that. And that always results in minority shareholders losing out and not maximizing their value. And we have seen the benefits of open competitive tenders in Penang. We have benefited in Penang, not just as a company, but has, I think, a state government through open tenders. Thirdly, it is a well-known fact that the trading volume on Bursa Malaysia is heavily dominated by GLCs. Now, not only does this crowd out the private sector and retail investors, it also distorts pricing and resource allocation mechanisms of the stock market. So there's a need to rationalize the role of the GLCs. The above three areas require focus so that our country can reap the benefits of having a transparent, efficient and robust equity market, which will not only benefit corporate interests, but also ensure that there's no mismanagement of funds. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I've touched earlier on the regulatory and governance aspects of the market. These aspects are often overlooked, even for researchers and academics. This is because actual stock market investing is seen as more interesting and challenging. And on this issue, a plethora of academicians and practitioners have derived various theories and hypotheses on how to invest in the stock market. I will be completely out of my depth to talk about what works and what doesn't. After all, that's why I'm a chief minister and not judging high. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we are very lucky that the few blue chip investments that we have made on behalf of the state government in the stock market since 2008 have been quite profitable. Uh. Not many, a few that we have invested and um, we are, of course, uh, uh, making very extremely uh, above Bursa Mal uh, Malaysia market returns. So we are very fortunate today to hear from someone who can tell us what works and what doesn't. Shanghai is a Penang boy who has gone out to conquer the world and successfully. 
and uh, his fund portfolio is one of the largest in Asia and has been rightly given the label of Asia's Warren Buffett. Through Mr. Cha's skill and dedication on stock analysis, he has been able to spot many overlooked and undervalued investments. And such value investing is Mr. Cha's forte and has been proven to be able to generate consistent returns. And of course, his uh, most prescient prediction was to bet on China. And it was has one of the earliest investors to put his bets on China. And this is what makes the legend, I think what began the legend of Cha Ching Hai. Now, I would be, it would be remiss of me if I mention Mr. Cha's achievements without mentioning his wife, his lovely wife, Eva. Because I think uh, he is what he is today because of the strong support given by Eva, who is with us today. Can we give her a round of applause? <laughs> with that, I leave you all to soak up the wisdom and experiences of Mr. Cha Ching Hai. Maybe he'll throw you some tips so you all can earn some money. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yang Ahmad Bohamad Lim Guan Eng for the welcoming speech. We shall now pass the stage to Professor Dato Wu Weng Tai, the moderator of the day to officiate the first part of our discussion titled From Journalist to Fund Manager, Discussion of an Unusual Career Path. Well, thank you all for coming. I think we cannot wait to get started. So I think, Zaryo, you are to deliver a few words first, right? Oh, is that good? So let's get Jia Qinghai on the podium, please. Welcome home. Thank you. Very good. 